Uh, my name is Gavin Beaver, and uh, for those of you that I haven't met, I think I've met quite a few people I see registered, but uh, I am the Relationship Manager for Extension Oz, which is a three organisation supported initiative that supports communities of practice. Uh, and you'll probably hear a bit about that as we go. So the Department of Prime Industries, Agriculture Victoria and AgriFutures uh, support the platform, which is part of the, an opportunity to hear about e-learning. So this webinar has really come about because, well, I guess COVID is definitely uh, motivating a lot of uh, opportunities in this space. And so we thought that it'd be timely from that perspective. But from an extension of perspective and working with communities of practice, we were really thinking about this as a way of people uh, maybe getting better learning outcomes and more targeted learning outcomes by uni using a for formalised e-learning approach as part of a perhaps a sweet approach for targeted audiences or people they're getting information out to. Um, so there's four presenters today, uh, Natasha and Alicia from Tokel New South Wales DPI and Sarah and Kellyanne from Agriculture Victoria. Uh, but we might just provide a bit of context uh, to start with. Um, and ask you a bit about where you're from and uh, what your experience with e-learning is, just to give uh, the presenters a bit of an idea of where you sit in the e-learning space. So if you could just answer the quick poll for us and I'll share that with everybody as we go. Um, as you're doing that, uh, in the sake interest of time, I'll introduce Natasha Hesson Tokal, who will start off the presentation. So essentially, this is all about you getting an overview of e-learning, uh, seeing some great examples and looking at how you might um, engage or, or use the approach. Thanks, Tash. Thanks, Gavin. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natasha Hess and I am Education Officer Digital Delivery at Tokau College. Tokau College is the registered training organisation for the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. We are located in the Hunter Valley, approximately 180 kilometres north of Sydney. You can see our lovely chapel in my background. We have approximately 100 residential students on campus studying the Cert 3 and Cert 4 in agriculture, as well as trainees who stay on campus for blocks of time. Additionally, we service around 5,000 online students all around primarily New South Wales, but also the rest of Australia. We have a range of around 350 courses online, ranging from a two year diploma in agriculture to a variety of online short courses and blended delivery options. We have around 140 teachers operating in our online environment. We have been in the digital delivery space for almost a decade, and we have a small team consisting of myself and Alicia who are full time, and we are supported by a few staff who are contractors and also our two graphic designers. I'll now hand you over to Alicia and she can introduce herself and as well as introduce you to e-learning. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thanks Tash. My name's Alicia Holmes and I am the uh, online learning officer for Tokau College. And now that as Tash, as Tash mentioned, the e-learning work we do here at Tokal is quite varied from formal accredited training to uh, mobile responsive micro learning that's publicly available to anyone. Um, I will preface this presentation by saying that what we're delivering today is a very broad and general overview of e-learning as Gavin mentioned. Um, in other words, we'll just be skimming the surface. Um, we have, however, used the Extension OS Community of Practice context to inform our choice of content. The e-learning examples we've chosen are mostly products of project work that's been done in collaboration with uh, various external stakeholders and not always directly related to our work as an RTO. Now, e-learning stands for electronic learning that can be accessed via a desktop, laptop, tablet or smartphone. The term was first coined in 1999 as the use of network technology to, to design, deliver, select, administer and extend learning. I like this definition because it really captures the e-learning experience as a whole, um, which I'll be talking about a bit more on later. So what does e-learning look like in practice for our students? Some will do their learning in a more traditional laptop at a desk setting, but a very high portion of our learners uh, just don't have the time for this. Instead, they will listen to a webinar on their way to work or zoom into their virtual classroom from the paddock. E-learning, particularly in the context of extension, uh, really needs to be made for busy people who have competing priorities. 
E-learning is not one dimensional. Instead, I want you to view it as an ecosystem. This helps encapsulate the relationship and dependencies of your options and the opportunities that today's technology affords us. It's important to start with an overarching strategy. This can be as simple or as complex as needed from a single specific problem to a five-year plan with detailed milestones. Now, Tokal's plan falls somewhere between the two, mainly because we have a number of different strategic priorities. So we need to allow opportunity for more specific strategizing based on each individual client's needs. In terms of e-learning content, an ecosystem approach lends itself to the curation of resources, both original and existing, that combine to create a dynamic learning experience. So before you even begin to play with the tools that and tech that Tash is gonna show you later, um, try and visualize your e-learning ecosystem. Start with what you already have and work out how you can best leverage those things. Uh, then you can move on to identifying any gaps. In practice, uh, you can start by identifying any existing strategies or strategic priorities that were established for your project or institution and use these as a framework for your digital learning strategy. This is exactly what we did at Tokau College. Then you can identify and map the components of your, eco of your ecosystem. This will be really helpful when making decisions about your e-learning, as many of the elements of your ecosystem are interdependent. Uh, for example, um, a, a future student might see an advertisement on Facebook for a course, which may take them to your, a web page for that course on your website, which will then take them off to the learning management system enrollment page and so on and so forth. Ensure that the learner remains at the center of your ecosystem. Keep coming back to the learner what they will experience, learn and achieve. Now, the online learning space presents so many opportunities for both the learner and the institution. Firstly, you can specifically target skills and knowledge that may be deficient uh, and develop learning resources and activities that fill those gaps. Learners can demonstrate their achievement of specific and measurable learning outcomes. Secondly, e-learning is scalable. It can be delivered en masse and reach many more people than your traditional face-to-face -face workshop setting. This is ideal for learning outcomes that are time sensitive. E-learning uh, has the potential to best accommodate everyone. And this is actually one of the main reasons why I'm so passionate about it. It can be designed to cater for the diverse needs of learners, their location availability, um, and any additional needs they may have, such as English as a second language or physical disabilities. There's also an opportunity for learners to rapidly acquire up-to-date information that maintains a consistent standard across an institution or project. For example, if WHS legislation changes, course content can be updated straight away to reflect these changes. Students can then receive a real-time notification of these changes uh, if it's delivered via a learning management system, which Tash will talk a little bit more on later. E-learning is cost and time effective in both development and delivery. However, this will depend on the model of e-learning chosen and the amount of forethought and planning that goes into its development. And finally, e-learning enables highly personalised learning. Learners can pick and choose which topics and activities are relevant to them and therefore have greater control over their experience. And seeing all this in practice, uh, you can anticipate the opportunities for your institution or organisation uh, by asking these questions. So what do we want our learners to know or be able to do? Um, this will help determine your measurable learning outcomes. How will we know what they understand or can do? If How will we know that they understand or can do the thing. So this is, this is where your uh, assessment processes come into play. Who's our target audience and how do they learn best? And when do they need the knowledge and skills? Now, the examples I've provided here are from our crop monitoring courses that, currently, that TOCAL currently hosts on our learner management system. Now, your responses to these questions will help determine whether or not e-learning is appropriate for your organisation. I won't spend too much time on the challenges and considerations because I'm a firm believer um, in that the challenges that arise in e-learning can be managed really well. Um, and if a challenge can't be managed, it's probably worth reconsidering e-learning as the chosen approach. For example, you probably wouldn't take a forklift licensing course online for obvious reasons. You may instead consider a blended approach though, 
that is a combination of online and face-to-face -face components. So we actually do this with our full drive training. So our students will actually complete um, some online tutorials around WHS and those kinds of things uh, before they actually attend the face-to-face -face workshop. One of the major concerns around e-learning is the lower rate of completion. Many students require some flexibility, but not too much, or the learning will fall further and further down their list of priorities. With this, we also need to examine whether formal completion is an appropriate me measure of success, particularly in the context of extension where students are accessing uh, freely available e-learning courses. Thinking back to the point of personalised learning, there's a high chance that learners will take what they need and then leave the rest for later. There's a certain level of digital literacy that, require, that students require in order to participate in e-learning and some students may experience adaptive difficulties. There's also the need for reliable internet connection, which may exclude certain groups of learners. And finally, an e-learning course may require more time from a trainer or facilitator than its face-to-face -face equivalent when you account for things like ongoing course maintenance, facilitating discussions, and providing uh, individual written feedback. Now, seeing this in practice, there are a number of, number of things you can do to actually mitigate the risks associated with e-learning. Um, always plan for what could go wrong, anticipate the difficulties and establish a plan B. We have learnt this the hard, the hard way, time and time again, actually, because it does depend on the project, as you'll find out in our case study a little bit later on. Now, you really need to carefully consider whether formal completion is an important measure of success, of course success. If it is, you'll need to strategize around this and possibly also incentivize. So for example, through a certificate of acknowledgement or something along those lines. When it comes to digital literacy, ensure you provide that support. This could be in the form of a contact person, how-to guides or recorded demonstrations, just to name a few. And finally, if e-learning doesn't satisfy your institution or project's needs, consider combining it with a face-to-face -face component. That way you get the best of both worlds. The blended approach, as mentioned, is just one of the many different strategies, methods and styles of instructions in the online learning space. It integrates a range of face-to-face -face and online learning experiences across both physical and virtual environments. The combination optimises student engagement and the achievement of learning outcomes for some cohorts and in particular contexts. Another option, of course, is e-learning that is delivered entirely online. This may be synchronous, where the online learners take, where the online learning takes place in real time uh, with groups of learners that travel through the course together um, or it could also be asynchronous, whereby the learners complete coursework in their own time. There are pros and cons for each approach that will need to be considered during the planning phase of your e-learning development. It's crucial that students are actively participating in the learning and I can't emphasize this enough. Um, we don't just want them to be passive uh, subjects receiving knowledge. It's just, it's not effective. Um, so I highly recommend from an instructional design perspective to consider incorporating learning activities such as problem solving, case studies and role plays. And lastly, we must not underestimate the value of social learning, that is learning from and with others, others which can include both direct and inter indirect interactions. Social learning can be facilitated online in a number of ways, including video conferencing, group discussions, collaborations, and the exchanging of feedback from both teachers and peers. When developing e-learning, it's important to keep both the learner and the overarching purpose at the center of all instructional design decisions. If practice change is the overarching purpose, how can we best facilitate that for our learners? It's very easy to get stuck at the remember and understand levels of thinking with self-marking knowledge-based quizzes being the go-to means of assessment. But to get learners actually applying their newly learned knowledge, we must provide opportunities for them to contextualize their learning and therefore apply it to their practice. And this can be quite a challenge uh, in the e-learning space. You can do this, however, by prompting learners to use their existing situation as a case study or through questions that require them to think about how the information can be used in new situations, such as those prompts uh, on this slide. Now the development process, I'll just speak briefly on this as we'll be delving into it more thoroughly during our case study. The e-learning development process will look slightly different for every, for every institution, 
uh, and sometimes even varies project to project here at Tokal. One thing I believe all e-learning developers will agree on though is the importance of a rigorous scoping process. Now I encourage the use of a scoping document. Um, now this is something that we'll provide as a resource uh, for you guys to have a look at later on um, that we use here at Tokal. Um, and this document outlines all of the variables for an e-learning project. Um, and it also requires stakeholders to answer a series of questions in order to clearly define the project's goals as well as the roles of each person within the project. So quite often we will have people come to us and go, okay, we want an e-learning um, we want an e-learning course developed. And once we start asking questions, that we all realise that they didn't really know what they wanted in the first place. So it's a really good um, process to go through, um, even, if, even if you're not necessarily looking at developing something straight away, but even just to um, help guide your, your, um, your approach towards e-learning and whether or not you should be considering it. Following the scoping process, um, the written content is then drafted and agreed on by stakeholders. The interactive tutorials, quizzes, etc., are storyboarded and a prototype is developed for initial review. Once the stakeholders are happy with the prototype, it's then populated with the content. Um, each module, once fully drafted, is sent out for review and any necess necessary edits are made. This is followed by a final review and any changes. Um, and then we publish the course, carry out user testing and quality assurance and apply user feedback ready for launch. The pilot undergoes an evaluation followed by any adjustments as needed. To support those involved in the development process, Tash and I created an e-learning hub on our learning management system. Um, it's called iCanvas, very original, um, considering our LMS is called Canvas. It's a repository for how-to guides, QA checklists, uh, Canvas our webinar recordings um, and links to other useful e-learning resources. It's been particularly useful for contractors who are new to both Canvas, which is our LMS, and online learning development. And that's about all I have time for today. I could go on for hours, um, but instead I'll now hand over to Tash who will share with you some of our top tips, tricks and tools. Thanks Tash. Thanks Alicia. In this section, I'll take you through the main tools that we use to deliver online learning. I will also share with you some tips that we have learned in our time operating in the digital delivery space. Firstly, what are e-learning authoring tools? An authoring tool is a software that enables you to create and arrange content into a standardized course structure. This structure can then be exported into several different multimedia types. Alicia has covered the things you need to think about before embarking on e-learning. However, there are some specific questions you need to ask before choosing an authoring tool that will be right for you. The first is, where am I going to house my e-learning? Will it be on a learner management system? Will it be on a website or social media? The answer to this question will determine how your e-learning will need to be exported and some authoring tools have limitations on this. Most of our e-learning is housed on our LMS Canvas because this is the best way to capture student data. And then LMS creates that learning ecosystem that Alicia was talking about, where a lot of the learning takes place outside of the authoring tool used. The second question is, who is my audience? This will determine the look and the feel of the course and how you would like it presented. What is the intention of the course? A visually based course used primarily for imparting information will be different to a heavy content laden course whose primary function is to change adoption practices. What content do I have? Do I have a lot of video? Is the content very text heavy? What kind of images do I have? For example, I'm currently developing a course on compliance in animal husbandry and a lot of the images are graphic and disturbing. Therefore, you don't want to be lessening the impact of this content by adding a bunch of pretty decorative images. Do I need to include assessment? The purpose of formative assessment is to monitor student learning and provide ongoing feedback to staff and students. It is assessment for learning designed to test knowledge. Formative assessments have low stakes and usually carry no grade. 
The goal of summative assessment is to evaluate student learning at the end of an instructional unit by comparing it against some standard or benchmark. Most of our courses include summative assessment, so we house this outside of our e-learning tutorials as this, this gives better student data. Our formative assessments we sometimes put within our tutorials, so this often decides which authoring tool we will use. There are many authoring tools on the market, but today I will only cover the four that I'm most familiar with and that we use here at Tokau College. They are Adobe Spark, Adobe Captivate, Articulate Storyline and Articulate Rise. I will go through each one of these and provide a comparison at the end. In conjunction with these main authoring tools, there are a couple of honourable mentions that we use to supplement our digital delivery. These are PowerPoint, Powtoon, Photoshop, Premiere and Zoom. Don't underestimate PowerPoint. It has come a long way and it is a great way to do quick and dirty e-learning. Here is a quick example of a PowerPoint that we have in Canvas. Powtoon is an animation and video creation software. A Powtoon example that we use here is plagiarism awareness. This course was initially designed for students that we have here on campus. So it was really the audience that dictated why we use this product. There was audio to that as well, but I don't think you could hear it. It is important that your e-learning contains various mediums, including images, video and audio. We use Adobe Photoshop to work with images and Adobe Premiere to work with video and audio. Zoom is a recent addition to our e-learning offerings, which really kicked off with the COVID environment. We had been dabbling a little bit in webinars and pre-recorded presentations, but it has really taken off in the last six months. Here is an example of our PowerPoint. Uh, excuse me for a second. Let's get into the right page. So this PowerPoint has a uh, articulate intro and it's got a zoom overlay. Now, I'm not sure if you could hear any of that, but that's had some really groovy music with the video. And you can see uh, one of our lecturers in the top right hand corner of the PowerPoint uh, presenting uh, to the students. The first uh, authoring tool I'll talk about is Captivate. Uh, it is the first authoring tool we used here at the college and many of our earlier e-learning products have been developed in this. Captivate has a click through design rather than a scroll. It is rather clunky and counterintuitive. Updating is more difficult than it needs to be. It is difficult to publish and receive feedback. On the plus side, it is totally customizable. It has inbuilt assessments and VR integration. You also have the capability to customize videos and create screen captures. We have moved away from using this at Tocal and we really only use it to update existing content. We don't uh, develop anything new in Captivate, preferring to use Articulate Storyline. We are aiming to move all courses to Captivate, uh, from Captivate. Um, it, that's on the cards for us at the moment. I'll just show you a brief example of a Captivate. As you can see, it's still got the old look and feel um, from one of our older products, but it's a click through design. Very basic and it's got some audio in the background.
Adobe Spark is the second Adobe product that we have started using uh, more recently. Spark is included with the Creative Cloud license if you use other Adobe products. You can also purchase it as a standalone. There is a free version that you can use quite well, but it does place a watermark on your project. Adobe Spark is scroll design rather than click through. However, you do have the option of creating a slideshow, which is click through. There is also a basic video editor that you can use to create basic videos. It is much less customizable than Captivate or Articulate. It is very visual and great to use if you have good photos and images. There are no built-in assessments. It is difficult to share with people and receive feedback. It does work great with social media and you can publish directly to Facebook and Instagram or embed in a web page. Here is a spark. As you can see, there's some really great drone images there and Spark really brings them out. Articulate Storyline is what we predominantly use and uh, we have been using as a replacement for Captivate. It is quite expensive, um, but there is a free trial available. I think it's a 30 day trial. It is a click through design and fully customizable. Honestly, I could rave about the capabilities of this project of this product for the rest of our allocated time. It is the it is a great product and the one that we prefer to use. Another great feature with Storyline is that it imports PowerPoints easily, including animations. Um, and you can edit them within within Storyline. Um, what I love about both Articulate products the most, which is Storyline and Rise, is the ease of receiving feedback. You can publish online and multiple people can comment on each slide and see each other's comments. This has been a real game changer for us. Articulate also has a great online community because there are so many things that you can do with it and there are lots of great examples of other people doing awesome things. An example of an Articulate is our quality assurance in beekeeping. Stop loading. That's okay, I oh, will move on. Articulate Rise. Rise is like Adobe Spark in the Articulate suite. Is it, it is included in the purchase with Articulate Storyline, a, along with a couple of other great tools like Replay for videos and Peak for screen captures. Rise is a scrolling design like Spark. There is lots of white space, which is good to break up text heavy content. It has customizable templates and is very user friendly, mostly drop and drag. You can add some test your knowledge formative type assessments, usually a quiz or a matching game. You can easily add video and audio, whereas you can't add an audio to Spark. You can publish in a variety of formats and it is our preference for scroll design e-learning. Uh, example. So this is the um, one that I showed you in Captivate where it had those old colors and it looked very dated. And this is the same, um, the same tutorial in Rise. And see how there's audio added. Here is a table comparing some of the features of the four different tools. I have covered most of them already. I just want to draw your attention to the degree of difficulty in learning how to use each tool. Spark and Rise are very easy and you will be creating e-learning within half an hour. Whereas with Articulate and Captivate, it will take you all weekend to learn how to use it and create what you want. And you are constantly learning more about what these products are capable of all the time. An important distinction between the Adobe and Articulate products is the ease of review. 
Captivate and Spark are more difficult to give and collect feedback on. I do have a more detailed comparison of um, Spark, and, of sorry, of Captivate and Articulate, and I'll put that in the chat box. I'm going to skip, skip through this slide because I'm running out of time. So just some final tips to wrap up. If you are using videos in your e-learning, I recommend always uploading these to YouTube first before inserting them. This is particularly important for students who have poor internet connections. YouTube is designed to meter the video download, whereas authoring tools do not. It will also reduce, reduce the file size of your e-learning because the videos are housed externally. Again, relating to file size, try reducing the size of your images as much as possible. Think about accessibility for people with disabilities. Current standards are the WCAG guidelines and um, they're, they're available all over Google. So just type in WCAG and um, there's a step through guide about how to make your e-learning accessible. Know your audience and provide additional support if needed particularly for those who are not familiar with technology or learning online. If you have time, storyboard. PowerPoint is great for this, as it forces you to chunk your information into slide-sized pieces. Word is fine to use for scrolling formats. Don't forget, forget to you include user accessibility testing in your e-learning process. Your product needs to be tested by a representative sample on all different devices and browsers. Seek specific feedback on course usability and address any issues before releasing to the public. After you have released to the public, still seek feedback. All of our courses have an evaluation at the end and this assists in continuous improvement. And the final tip, e-learning is like a living beast. It is rarely set and forget. The online space is ever changing. Links will always break. Content will need to be updated. Make sure to regularly review your e-learning to ensure that everything is still functioning as it should and that your content is still up to date and relevant. That's about it from me. And now I'll hand over to, to the guys from uh, AgVic, Kellyanne and Sarah. Hello, I'm just unmuting and requesting control of the screen. There we go. So I'll just click through those slides if... I'll just was... mute myself, hang yeah. Just skipping over a couple of slides. Okay, so just taking you So thanks, um, Alicia and Natasha for, yeah, they've definitely, um, we've learnt a lot off the the guys from Tokal or New South DPI um, on our e-learning journey with Agriculture Victoria and uh, we're way behind you guys so this is really just about our journey and what we're doing and where we're up to so I can see there's quite a few people on here from AgVic so yeah it'd be good to let you know where we're up to. So a couple of years ago I guess we had started developing or thinking about developing e-learning modules as part of our project delivery. And at the time we sort of thought, well, we developed one for a young farmer project on farm business and we had nowhere to house it. So we started looking at options of, you know, where are we going to put this e-learn? And if we want to develop more e-learns, you know, where are we going to put them? So, you know, we can contract them onto other people's LMS platforms, like the one at Tocal or uh, Plant Health Australia have got one and yeah, some other people have got one as well. Uh, internally to AgVic, we had a, a knowledge hub, which was, you know, for internal uh, learning or e-learns, but couldn't be used for an external audience. So that's when I guess the, the light bulb um, or the idea progressed and we thought we, yeah, would establish an AgVic learning management system. So, and this, yeah, will enable us to deliver deliver that targeted learning and training materials to our audiences. Uh, there's a wide range of uses, as the girls have said, with, you know, online inductions for contractors, uh, e-learning for, you know, for learning sake, uh, as well as crop protection, adding quizzes and, and also targeting our audience's knowledge change. 
and as many of you know, in the development of any IT project, it's not always straightforward. So it's a little bit of a bendy road from where we've come from to where we are today. So yeah, back in July, 2018, we started a working group. And we had to put a business case up to our digital management committee for approval. Uh, we got the green light for that. And then we went about looking for that sort of LMS to use and to set up with a company to do that build for us. So that started in late 2018 and was finished by the end of 2018. And just to note, the AgVic working group that we established had representatives from a wide range of business groups in AgVic and we're not, I get, we're not paid. It's not a specific project like it is with Tokal where they've got their defined group and it's, you know, part of the business of Tokal. This was, you know, a few of us that we had an interest in wanting to get this up and going that would meet sort of outside our general project work. So we commenced the pilot period where we uploaded a few e-learns to that LMS and just really gave that that LMS that we had a try to see, you know, how it worked, what we liked, what we didn't like. Uh, back in March this year, at the end of the pilot, we decided, loved the idea of developing e-learns and, and using that to complement what we do to deliver our services, uh, but the platform didn't really sort of meet the needs that we're after. So we went out and searched for some, yeah, different options, again, talking to Tokal, looked at what other people are using, looked at what the internal was using. And uh, so I'll answer Felicity's question as I'm doing this. So we ended up going with a, a Birch platform. So it's pretty much an off the shelf product, but modified for us and for our use. So, but Sarah will go into that in more detail in a second. Uh, so in May, we ramped up, well, March, we also had coronavirus and most of us in Victoria got sent home, working from home, still at home. Um, haven't been back to the office since March. So I guess this online delivery and di digital delivery has become even more important for us down here. So we had over 60 staff attend a couple of training courses on e-learning, so trying to upskill our staff. And then we've literally just launched our new LMS platform, which is the Birch platform on the 6th of August. So yes, it will be interesting to see where the road takes us from, from here. Uh, my next slide, if it's gonna work for me. There we go. Uh, so the eLearn training that we conducted, so we had 46 staff complete the Articulate 360 training. So this really focused on the RISE, the Articulate RISE product. So we thought we'd start with RISE rather than sort of throwing people into the storyline um, software. So we just want to, you know, that sort of easier in and then the staff that really want to develop their e-learning uh, products and their skills, then it gives them a good lead on to go do the Articulate Storyline course. So yeah, 46 staff attended those. Uh, yeah, 87.5% recommend to others, which is great. And then it was interesting, you see the participants 50% rate it relevant for their job and satisfaction. So it was really interesting. A lot of people put their hand up for this training, not probably knowing even what it was about and whether they would use it in their, their work. So that really showed through the analysis. Uh, 52 staff completed the e-learn e design essentials training and we thought that this was another good starting course to give people the really good foundations in you know what is an e-learn, how to create a good e-learn e um, and sort of get those skills and transferring the knowledge you've got from extension and delivering workshops and face-to-face uh, -face training to how you can convert that into e-learning. And this is our brand new, the look of our site. So we have a subdomain set up within uh, Agriculture Victoria. So it's learning.agriculture.vic.gov.au. And yeah, feel free to go in and have a look. But remember, we are definitely at the, you know, commencement phase uh, as opposed to, you know, we strive to be where Tokal is in a, in a few years time. 
And yeah, I guess the other difference for us is that we're not um, a registered training organisation either. So you know, a lot of our courses will be focused towards sort of learning, uh, yeah, extension, inductions, uh, those sorts of things. But I'll hand over to Sarah Brown now, who will show you a bit more of the ins and the outs of our LMS platform. Uh, thanks, Kel. Um, so for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Sarah Brown um, and I help out a lot with all of this um, LMS and e-learning stuff um, in AgVic. Um, so yeah, as Kel mentioned, earlier this year we decided that um, our previous learning management system was uh, just, it just wasn't the right one for us. Um, it was sort of more focused on internal organisational training type uh, content rather than um, farmers and agronomists and a, a real external focused audience. Um, so I contacted uh, three, four different suppliers with three different platforms and spoke with them had meetings, we went through all of them. And after about six weeks, we settled on the Birch Learning Platform, which was developed uh, from Be Online Learning, who are also the company that did all of our um, e-learning training a couple of months ago. Uh, the reasons why we went for the Birch Learning Platform were that it was very simple to use um, and intuitive uh, and the problems that we were having with our previous um, with our previous eLearn our platform was that it was complex and complicated not only did somehow skip through a few slides there sorry Sarah that's me you're asking for approval when I can't yeah. there we go it's done <laughs> I don't know how that happened um, Anyway, uh, we, yeah, we had the problem that it was incredibly complex and complicated, not only for the users coming into it to do the e-learning, but also for us as admins on the back end, trying to, to organize everything as well. As Cal mentioned, we aren't projected to do this. Um, we just do it because uh, we feel that there's a need for it. Um, so the Birch learning platform just really worked for us. Um, to the next slide. Uh, so this is an example of what our Birch platform looks like uh, and some of the courses that we have on there. Um, we like using um, Be Online Learning as well because uh, they're a bit of a one-stop shop for us. So they've not only got our Birch learning platform, um, they do all the training for Articulate. They're the only certified Articulate trainers in Australia. Um, and they also develop e-learning content as well. So if we need something that's a little bit more complex or if certain projects may have a little bit extra money or something that they just want to pay somebody to do it, they don't want to have to worry about creating it themselves. Um, the online learning can do that for us as well. Um, so it sort of became a bit of a one-stop shop. There was more than one benefit of moving to the Birch platform. Um, now these courses can, the view will change depending on what connections a user has on our platform. So if they come to the site and they put in that they're a farmer, they will see all the courses that have the farmer connection to them. If they come to the site and put in that they're a service provider or an agronomist, they'll see all the courses in their goals catalog that are available for agronomists or service providers. Um, we have a few different connections and stuff um, and that helps us to really target um, our audience and, and make sure that learning that's directed just for them um, so that, yeah, they can get what they need. Um, we also have uh, one of the functionalities of the Birch platform uh, was that we, it allowed us to have multiple communities. Um, so we have the one platform with multiple communities that sit side by side each other. Um, they all have their own login page. Um, the connections can be different. 
Um, so here's an example of the other one that we've got set up at the moment, which is for Animal Welfare Victoria. Their e-learning courses are a little bit more targeted towards domestic animals uh, rather than farming. So we created them another community. Um, there is another one coming up as well that'll be uh, responsible pet ownership professional development for midwives and nurses. Um, so that will also sit alongside and that just helps us better target those e-learning courses. Um, and then the people that need to go to that particular community can go in their own login page um, and they don't see any of the other stuff. Um, just helps us to kind of target that a little bit better. Uh, this is an example of our farm business e-learning course. Um, up the top, the goal overview is how it looks on a Birch platform. Uh, so the user can register themselves in it. Uh, they, once they're registered, they will launch the e-learning module, which is the bottom picture. Um, and that particular course was created in RISE. Uh, and then once they finish, they get a link to go and do an evaluation on that particular course as well. Uh, this particular course is an example of a course that was actually designed for an internal audience. So it was put on our internal knowledge hub. Um, there became an issue where uh, the biosecurity people who created this e-learning module wanted um, external people to be able to complete it, such as Victoria Police, so that in the event of a livestock standstill, Victoria Police would know what AgVic was doing. Um, and what our role would be. So the Vic Police can't get onto our Knowledge Hub. So we made this available on our um, Birch platform. And uh, this has got the connections are quite tight on this. So they need to be put into specific connections to be able to access this. Um, and they get put into that when they select certain things on their sign up forms. Um, so that uh, Vic Police can come and complete the same course that we did. Um, and that's about it. We've got um, a number of other courses upcoming. Um, hopefully in the next few months, everybody's been a bit excited since doing the training. So um, I know of quite a few off the top of my head that will be popping up in the next couple of months, which is very exciting. And is there anything else you wanted to add, Kel? You're still muted. You need to pull your mic down. <laughs> so, and that, that covers it from, from us, I reckon. It just yeah, shows that we are at the beginning of our journey and these technology sort of platform developments, yeah, don't happen overnight. So, yeah, it would be really interesting to see where we are in a, another 12 months' time. Over well, to you, you, Gavin. Yep. Yeah, thank you all. So um, I've just uh, done a short poll. For those of you who can hang on, it's probably worth Alicia just demonstrating another case study as an example for you all. Um, but today really has been about giving you an overview and understanding what is out there. Uh, we've had five different people in five different locations delivering. So, you know, that's, and these people have put a lot of time and effort actually into designing this, this little overview and opportunity for you all. So we really must thank them for that. Uh, but I guess the opportunity for you now is to engage further with us and, uh, and consider what you might or would like to do in this space. And essentially, you know, this challenge of practice change that many projects and certainly our communities of practice are challenged with, uh, we're, we're suggesting that the e-learning approach, the module approach, could be part of the blend, could be part of the suite that you do in your projects to deliver targeted learning outcomes. So I guess that's our challenge to you is, uh, would you think about it and do something, um, yeah, uh, in that space? Um, so, Alicia, while we um, let people put any questions into the chat, would you perhaps like to do that final case study for us? Yes, yeah, sorry, Gavin, I'll jump in. I apologise. This was supposed to follow my bit and I jumped over it. <laughs> so, um, we were recently asked to do a rapid development for New South Wales Health and the New South Wales Food Authority. They wanted a course to promote COVID-19 awareness in the New South Wales food industry. They needed it to be ready on the 1st of June and we had exactly one week. 
We created a project team, which consisted of myself, Alicia, our boss, Michelle, and her boss, Julie. There was, only three, there was also three people from the food authority. We met every day in the morning to set milestones for the following day. We attempted to identify any potential risks and delays early on. Our team had defined roles. I was taking care of the learner management system setup. Alicia did the course development and Michelle was in charge of setting up the help desk. I'll take you for a brief look at the course. So it's developed in uh, Articulate Storyline. And there's a quiz at the end that has 20 questions that everybody must get right to um, get their certificate. Those, so, sorry, those, Alicia. That's okay. I was saying for those interested, you can go and do the course. <laughs> yes, we'll um, provide the link. Do you want to put that in the chat for me, please, Alicia? Yeah, I will do that. Thank you. So my job was to set up Canvas, which would host the e-learning module. We had set up a completely new instance as the Food Authority was estimating a possible, possible 50,000 users and we did not want them all mixed up with our 5,000. So negotiations had to be undertaken with Canvas to secure a new instance. We got the access on Friday before the Monday we launched. While we were waiting for this, we built everything in our own instance. So once we had access, we could just move it over. The new instance had to be branded with Food Authority logos and colours. The course needed a banner and a landing page. There, has to, there had to be a course tile. The login page needed to be branded. The certificate needed to be created. We needed to decide the best way to issue certificates. We usually use a Google form for this, but we had never had such a volume before. So we weighed up whether to, or not to go with a paid subscription certificate issuer. However, in the end, we decided to stick with what we knew rather than to venture into the unknown. The certificate needed to be designed and also required a date stamp, which was a little tricky. The course needed to be promoted on various government websites. So content and instructions for those pages were also needed. We also needed to organise user accessibility testing, which we normally do over a couple of weeks. But in this particular case, we did over the weekend. So we needed to create a survey, send it out, collect the feedback, discuss and decide which feedback we would take on board and then improve the course in relation to that feedback. We also wanted to provide users with a variety of ways to seek help if they needed it. We organised three different help options a 1-800 number, an email, and a link within Canvas. We had to set up the phone number and the email addresses through the department, so that was not a quick or easy process. We held discussions over the times the 1-800 number would be manned. We needed to organise staff to man it during these hours. These staff needed to be trained. Help desk processes needed to be set up. We created a Google form with steps for the help desk staff to follow and links to help sheets as they work their way through help desk calls. We did this to simplify the process for staff, but also so that we could collect and track important help desk data. We held webinars to train staff in these processes. Alicia will now talk to you about the development process for this case study. Yes, um, just before I do, um, just an answer to Felicity, um, a new instance of Canvas um, is essentially another, a separate account of Canvas. So we had our own Tokau College instance of Canvas, um, but because we were predicting such a large volume of students, um, we had to discuss with Canvas uh, creating a new instance specifically for the Food Authority. Um, and there are conversations about how they will, how they're planning on using that instance for other courses. Um, but at this stage, it is just um, for the food, a COVID-19 awareness for food safety course. Um, so in terms of the um, tutorial development, so uh, did Tash mention we had seven days? Uh, yes. So we, <laughs> we employed an agile development process, obviously due to the time constraints. Um, the content was written and provided to me in a Word document by the subject matter expert. After seeing the content, I went back to him and um, I said, um, 
the maximum number of words per slide preferably is 100. And the reason I did this is because I knew we had such a limited amount of time and we have fallen into the trap before of trying to squeeze a lot of written content into not very many slides. And it's just, it's just not good for um, the learner. Um, it's too overwhelming and to be honest, they won't read it. So um, the subject matter expert then went through the content and actually, um, and uh, well, I guess he went through it again and culled it really um, so that it would be uh, more appropriate for the, the articulate storyline design. Um, following that process, I then designed a prototype, which included uh, just an opening slide, a content slide, a quiz slide, um, and this was, and I used the Food Authority style guide uh, to inform the graphic design. So we did not have time to outsource our graphic design. We are lucky enough, as Tash mentioned at the beginning, to have a couple of graphic designers on board. Um, we didn't have time to um, get their uh, get them get get their input. So um, we obviously we got them to have a look at it uh, to make sure there were no really terrible things that we were doing. Um, but yeah, so that was that was what we did. Um, and once we sought feedback on that prototype and, and the stakeholders were happy um, with everything, including the colours, the images, the iconography, uh, the interactions, um, then we went ahead and populated that, that course with the content and built all of the additional interactions. Um, I did have a fair bit of creative liberty with this. Um, we literally, it was just in a Word document. So in terms of all the interactions you see, you will notice that most of them are fairly simple click and reveal um, interactions. Um, however, there are a couple of really good ones um, in there and, and that always helps to um, being able to um, have a play with the information and, and sort of present it a bit more creatively. Um, we then sought feedback on the first draft. So once that was completed um, and the stakeholders all commented on a review link. So this is one of the really uh, great advantages of articulate products is that you can share them very easily for uh, review. So they actually commented on, um, on, the, on the review link. So essentially you publish the tutorial um, as a review link. So you just share the URL. So then um, anyone you want to comment can then comment and you can actually refresh, you can re-upload once or republish to that URL, that same URL once you've made changes. So actually to this day, I have some edits to make to this course today um, and all those, all those comments are there ready to go. So then once I've made those changes, I can simply republish to that same URL uh, for them to check to make sure they're happy with the changes. There was some a fair bit of back and forth with making changes, as you can see with this uh, uh, this arrow here. So we kind of went from um, a draft to review and then back to make changes and review. And that probably happened about um, probably around five or six times, I would say, because it was quite quick. Um, but once the final changes were made, we then published the course on Canvas ready for user testing. Tested, testers completed a survey monkey form um, answering a series of questions around accessibility and functionality. And we actually didn't have to make any changes following the user testing, which was great. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a summary of the development process. Um, and I'll hand back to Tash, who will talk to you about um, some of the problems we experienced and the lessons that we learned during this process. Oh, Tash, you muted. Sorry, <laughs> e-learning <laughs> specialist. <laughs> um, so um, since uh, from today, we've had about 25,000 certificates issued in this course, um, and we're in negotiations to increase this substantially for next year. It was such a unique project in many ways, the short time frame, the volume of students, the timely content, but it was such a great example of the e-learning process. We have experienced some problems and learned some lessons. We initially over-serviced the help desk because we had no idea how many help requests we would receive. We had a few issues with our certificates. We ran over the quota issued by the department, so our certificates stopped being issued instantaneously. We had to set up a trigger for that to happen, so, it, so they now happen every hour. 
Uh, we also transitioned from Google to Microsoft a few weeks ago, and we weren't anticipating any problems. However, we were locked out of the Google account, which was issuing the certificates, because uh, we were flagged as spam for uh, issuing so many emails. Uh, we were able to set up an external Google Drive and recreate the certificate, and we did this late on a Friday night in about two hours. So the course was down for about two hours. Um, through our help desk data, we have discovered that there is an issue with accessing the certificates when using Safari. Uh, although we have clearly stated on everywhere where you access the course uh, that Chrome is the preferred browser, Safari is still the default uh, browser for iPads and iPhones, so that has been a bit of a problem. Um, another problem we have experienced in both of our Canvas instances is uh, spam from rogue enrolments. So Canvas implemented a recapture solution uh, to address this. So that is the where you click I am not a robot on websites. Um, however, implementing this fix actually stopped the course from working. So we were locked out of our course for about 24 hours before we notified that this was a problem. So this led us to um, review our help desk procedures. Um, but this does lead me to my last point with all the exclamation marks, which is if something changes, test it. Do not assume that because you are not expecting any problems that there won't be any. Um, and that's about it from me. Thanks so much, um, Tash, and also for Alicia for that. Another case study example, and, um, and I guess this is now the opportunity for you all, for those who want to stay on, stay on and ask any further questions. Uh, these guys can stay on as well. So often we get the opportunity to have experts together like this. Um, this is a product of how we work in Extension Oz. So perhaps this is an example for you all for those that aren't involved in Extension Oz is through our technical working group approach and then through the communities that formed in Extension Oz, we have this network of people that uh, operate across all de uh, disciplines of research development and extension. So we can call on, uh, on people to assist you. Uh, and to that end, any questions now or in the future are really welcome. So uh, TOCAL have uh, a service deliverer in this space, they're a registered training organisation. So um, Tash, uh, people can contact you if they want assistance with uh, online uh, development of e-learning modules. Yes, please do. And um, Kel, could you perhaps just update where AgVic is up to in terms of being a service provider to people in Agriculture Victoria? Yeah, so from an AgVic perspective, so we can load any courses on this on the LMS now. So it's really just if there's someone on here that hasn't been in touch with either Sarah or myself about this, yeah, just get in touch with us and um, yeah, we can uh, either help you out or yeah, pass you other names on the working group that might be in your division. But yeah, it's I guess the sky's the limit for us now and hopefully we'll, as Sarah said, we've got a lot of courses in development. So it's just, we can, yeah, people can use it for whatever they may wish in to complement their learning at the moment while we're all based at home and can't do face-to-face -face delivery. So those nag big, that's your pathway through and um, it's fabulous that through Extension Health we've got these two organisations working closely together and can do this. So for those of you outside ag big, obviously TOCAL and uh, will be a point of contact for you if you need some direct assistance. Um, I don't see too many questions coming through as now in the chat box. Um, Nico had a question about um, uh, about engagement and encouraging that, tips and tricks. Perhaps we could finish with any comments from the panel on that and we'll bring the webinar to a close. Yeah, I'll jump in on this one, Gavin. This is an ongoing challenge, particularly for asynchronous uh, online learning where people are working through it at their own pace. Um, we do find it takes a lot longer, even with our accredited training, uh, it takes a lot longer for people to get through the tasks um, and to actually engage with the content. Um, one thing, a model that we have trialled recently is it's sort of a combination of synchronous and asynchronous. So while the course is uh, promoted as a self-paced course, we do have weekly scheduled live webinars that people um, 
we, we really recommend that people attend. Um, and we're finding that that's a really good way to um, get people in, involved and engage and logging on um, and asking questions and those kinds of things. We have tried discussion forums, um, but we're finding that they, they do require a lot of input from a trainer or facilitator. Um, they don't tend to happen organically. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, with the right input from trainers, uh, they, they can get off the ground. Um, we've had some really good discussions in um, within our B program. Um, uh, and uh, just on a side note, um, just to demonstrate how, um, or I guess one of the crazy opportunities of e-learning, we actually hosted um, a webinar for our Cert 3, Cert 3s in beekeeping, beekeeping on transporting hives. And we actually had uh, one of our students join and he was a passenger in a truck that was transporting bees. So that was really cool um, to have that and just, yeah, it's just a really unique opportunity. But yeah, in terms of engagement, I definitely, if you can um, head towards the, more the social, the social learning um, strategies. Thanks, Alicia. Um, and there's just one last quick question from Felicity about using reCAPTCHA and whether it can check webinar registrations via Zoom. I don't know the answer to that one, Gavin. No, I was just saying, I've got Jodie's on the line. Jodie, I don't know, what do we do with the Zoom account with ours, but we don't use reCAPTCHA. But um, so at the moment, oh, because she can't talk. Yep. Yeah, no, we'll come back to you, Felicity, on that one. Um, at the moment with our webinar registrations, we just directly check the uh, registration um, log in Zoom, but I don't know about its ability to I know through. Zoom has also implemented the waiting room to stop those kind of spammers from getting in. Yeah, I think that's what Jodes does because there has been some people come in at like weird hours of the night and then you can just kick them out. Yep. Yep. So yeah, that's, that's, you, that's true and it's also going to be made compulsory. And I saw a, a message came through from Zoom from um, saying they're going to make that compulsory, the waiting room function, mm -hmm. that you'll have the waiting room to go through. Okay, um, thank you all for your presentation. Thank you also for the work that you put in. I know you guys, you certainly went above and beyond. So thank you all so much. And uh, we will be back in touch. So we'll give you the resources that we spoke about, um, the slides, and there'll be a recording of the webinar. Bye for now, everyone. And um, yeah, everyone stay safe.